Welcome back to Straight Facts. Sorry about being late today. It's my fault. Kids on the school run, traffic and all that. Lee was actually, for the first time in many, many weeks, was on time. So apologies for being late. If you're watching the playback, you're not going to care because you, you can't be late. But yeah, everyone's been waiting. Thank you very much indeed. Lee, how are you, my friend? You good? You well? Uh, I'm good, man. Yeah, I've got an abscess on this tooth down here. It's killing me. But we're tanked up on antibiotics. And it takes a lot for me to take antibiotics, Terry. Normally, I just go through the pain threshold. Yeah, but as you've probably had before an abscess, it is not nice. And um, although I saying only... that, I did sleep extremely well. I, I didn't wake up at all. It was like daytime's more of a pain than nighttime for some reason. But there we go. But other than that, I'm all good. I hear you, mate. Listen, I'm bad too, fake. I'm only quoting my mum here. So any ladies listening, I'm not making a general assumption. I've got to put that out there because of the culture we live in. But my mum always said, by the way, after having five children, that she would rather give birth again than the two fakes she had when she had an abscess. That's just, just what my mum said. <laughs> Anecdotal. I'm being very careful of what I say. So, yes, it can be very painful. I big up to Kyle. He says beer will cu cure your toothache. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? The only thing that's calming it down, to be fair, yeah, is ice cold drink. Yeah, and just like sit on it for a couple of seconds. But yeah, I'll be all right. It's a toothache, isn't it? It's not the end of the world. Yes, there's a lot worse things that you could have in this world. As you say, there's, there's, there's a lot more things that could be wrong with you than that. Uh, viewers, we've got loads to talk about today. The uh, Chelsea versus Arsenal. We're looking at the Man United takeover. And there's two big questions I've got for, uh, for Lee about Cristiano Ronaldo and for Erling Haaland. So stay tuned for them on the show today. I wanted to start off, though, with the Man United partial takeover. The... So Jim Ratcliffe, 25%, 1.3 billion pound of investment. What's your take on this? Firstly, from a, do you think it's a good or a bad thing for Man United? And secondly, I know you've been quite vocal about the fans in terms of the fans are a disgrace on this. But yeah, I wanted to get your opinion on this takeover, your thoughts on whether it will help Man United. And then, of course, your, your view of the fans' reaction to this. Um, I'm not surprised, if I'm being honest. Um it would have made more sense to do a full takeover. But as we know, the Glazers don't make sense. <laughs> and um, they're not interested in the football club. They're only there to get paid. Hence why they've taken so much money out of the club over the years. They're not serious about winning. Yeah, it's all about maximising revenue and, um, and income. But yeah, they've, they've gone down the route of 25%. And it's, it's crazy. I've seen like, the fallout from it when it was first announced. Like everyone was going mad. The Glazers out was hashtagged and trending everywhere. And fast forward 48 hours or so, everyone's now kind of coming around to, yeah, so Jim, it can't, it's not that bad. You know, it's, you know, we'll see what happens. We need to see the outline. I see United Supporters Trust posting out uh, a statement saying that they, you know, they're not opposed to it. They didn't exactly put, I'm paraphrasing, but they're not opposed to it. They just want to see the outlines of Sir Jim's plans and, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Now I've seen a load of media outlets today trying to put a positive spin on it, and it's like, mate, your football club's been in the gutter for a long time. Yeah, it's nowhere near the club it used to be, and this is probably the worst thing that could happen because now you've got another guy coming in um, who's not going to be serious. Let's just be real with it. He owns two football clubs, one in Switzerland, I think, and one in one in France, like. You've only got to have a look at what he's done to Nice since he's been there. And then people are saying, oh, yeah, but they're currently sat one point off top. They had the four years that he's owned it. They've never got in the Champions League. And the four years before he owned it, they were in it three years out of four. And people are saying, yeah, but he can't compete with PSG. Well, why? Why can't he? You know, if he's this great guy and this big guy that's going to come into United, you've only got to have a look at Nice. How is he going to overtake Man City if he can't over? or get closer to PSG every year and try and nick some trophies here and there. What's he going to do with United? And I know the revenue streams are different, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> but the the premise remains the same. You still got to overtake Man City. Yeah, and I don't see how he's going to do that. Yeah, firstly, he's only going to have 
it's probably not he's probably not going to have that much of an involvement because the Glazers are still going to have the monopoly on the football club. And here's what it is, isn't it? Man United fans are going to try and convince themselves this ain't a bad thing when the reality is you're just going to get worse and worse. Yeah, last season was probably good in terms of winning a trophy. You make the most of it because you ain't winning one for a long time, mate. Yeah, you, the way your club is set up right now, the, the stadium's falling down, um, the toilets are leaking everywhere on match day, you've got little mini protests going on here, there and everywhere, and then they walk in the ground with their kit on and the flag, the, the flag with um, 1958 or whatever on a duvet written in red. The Norwich scarves are out. You know, go and buy an eight quid pie that's like a rock. Like, business is booming at United. Yeah, the only thing that ain't booming is on field. You know, you've got you've got a team of players that half of them shouldn't be there. You've got a manager who I don't think is good enough for your club, um, just buying up his um, agents, players, or players that he's managed before or have played in the Dutch league. And it's all a bit of a mess, isn't it? And, you know, we've had loads of conversations on here about the manager, but both of us have agreed it does come from above. And now you've gone and gone down the route of let's just take 25% instead of actually getting rid of the football club and walking away. It's just pure greed. Yeah, but we know they're greedy. And <laughs> don't expect anything different. Yeah, if anything, I think it'll get worse. Yeah, they might show willing and, and make the training ground a little bit better and upgrade some of the facilities, but how's that going to change the on-field results? I don't really see how it does. I think if you had gone down the Qatar route, you know that they're going to strive for excellence. You know that they're going to come in and try and make Man United great again. Whereas I don't see that with Jim Radcliffe. I really don't. Yeah, look, Joe, you know interesting about it? For instance, the, the Man United Supporters Trust, they weren't twerking for the Qataris. They were always more... In, they wanted to Jim Radcliffe. So when people like that I see are open-minded and positive, me being fair, I'll say, well, do you know what? You weren't somebody that wanted the Qataris over him like me. So... I don't want to paint every Man United fan or group with the same brush because there were many that wanted Sir Jim Ratcliffe over the Qataris. For one reason or another, they did. I agree with a lot of what you've said, though, in, in terms of the way it's all reading in the newspapers. Sounds great. 1.3 billion being invested, new stadium, new training facilities. There's so much that's being said that if we do improve, I do believe there will be an improvement on the field. And the reason that I say that is because it will make the players take the club more seriously just seeing those types of improvements being made how do we know this sean longstaff and about three or four other newcastle players have spoken about this at length that since the new owners came in since they changed started improving training facilities etc they said they felt a difference at the club there was almost like a new mood around now united are not it's not going to happen in the same way because it isn't 100 new ownership but again the way it's reading is that he is going to get full control over running the sporting element and wants to bring in some of the best in class to run those areas. So on paper, it reads good. As good as it can be, that is. However, as I've said to a lot of United fans, I'm not going to throw my toys out the pram. Every single news article that comes out, and I said my piece on Saturday, on Sunday morning, I feel like this could finish the club off for good if this goes wrong, and I, and I stand by that. But I'm okay. You're telling me you're going to do the right things. I'm now going to use those words in those media briefings from your people. And I'm going to hold you, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, and the Glazers accountable for what you're promising now. You're, imp you're promising new stadia or improvements, new training facilities. You're, you're talking about improving the, the squad and helping out with the debt. What happens to that 1.3 billion? And this is where Man United fans are really going to prove whether they love the club in terms of what the club is meant, how the club is meant to be run and what it's meant to achieve and represent versus using the football club as a social club or as a fashion accessory. Because if 1.3 billion comes in and debt isn't paid off and the debt is hurting us, if the debt isn't paid off and improvements aren't made around multiple rotting areas and the Glaziers just pocket all of it and these fans continue to give money to them, they deserve it because we're not talking about something that's deeply moral here. You know, we're not talking about something that's killing people, harming people, putting people in hospital, making people bankrupt, ruining lives. We are talking sport. You have a choice in this. And if you continue to fund and support people that are pillaging this football club, you deserve it because you are a big part of that problem. If, however, that money is now used to pay debt off, 
stadiums improving, we get the Paul Mitchells of this world coming in, we start to see improvements, then, then, I, then, then, then I look at it as, okay, well, maybe now definitely financially support it because we can see it's moving in the right direction and we still want the club to be successful. We also have to push to see what these mechanisms look like for a full takeover. Because if they can just pull the plug on this deal anytime they want and maintain 75%, again, we could be in lumber again in the future. So there's so many unanswered questions about this. Before the Qatar Rids got involved with Man United fans have been happy with this a year ago, 18 months ago, probably. But then we saw the light at very, the end of a very different tunnel and a lot of us wanted it. So yeah, I am gutted that we haven't got the Qatari owners. The only thing, and I said it on yesterday's show, that I am happy about in terms of not getting um, Sheikh Jassim is that I, I know what it would have been like on every stream after we won. I know what it would have been like with the media every time Man United improved or progressed. Question marks over the morality of our funding would have come up. And that's probably the only element of me that's happy that I'm not going to have to deal with those questions on a day-to-day. Because every stream we did about the takeover, potential takeover, that was the rhetoric in the comments section. So that's the only element I'm glad about is that people don't get to push their fake pseudo-moralistic stances on me um every single game because we knew they would have we don't we know that happens every day now um on, on social media as it is but yeah look, i'm not i'm not like i'm not all doom and gloom about this i'm not excited about it either though i, I am i am massively fearful i don't trust the glazers as far as i could throw them but we'll see and you know very much as you say you have done from 2004-5 when you look at what the people running your club said, why you were knocking the stadium down, why you're moving, what you're going to achieve. That's very much what I'm doing with this. You are promising X, Y, and Z. Fine. I'm going to, you know how I am as a person. I'm, I'm going to take your word for it to begin with and then see how you deliver. Does that make sense? So, so the thing is, sorry to cut you off. I do think that's an issue though, Terry, yeah? because you've still got the same problem at your football club, the Glazers, right? And Whilst you're going to give that an opportunity to work with Jim Radcliffe and he's going to run the football inside of it day to day, whatever, whatever, ultimately the buck stops with the Glazers and they're going to have the final say on anything. Yeah, let's just be real with that, right? So all the people that wanted Qataris there, right, and a full takeover, every single one of them should be protesting every single game from now to the end of the season. Right? When I say protesting, they've already paid for their season tickets, whatever, whatever. But I just said this with Rance a minute ago. We were chatting a minute ago and I said, just go in the stadium, scan your ticket, and walk out. Go and protest outside. So go in. So now you get your credit. Like on the, you, you've scanned your ticket, so it don't mean you've missed a game on your season ticket, which means you'll be allowed to renew it because you would have hit a certain percentage, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so if you want to renew it, that's cool. But now go and protest. Do a walkout every single game, every single home game, whether it's aired on TV in England or not. It's aired around the world. I can watch the 3 o'clock kickoffs if you can yeah, so can people in America and all over other countries around the world. They can watch Man United at three o'clock. Yeah, so make a stand. If you're that against the, um, the Radcliffe deal and the and the Glazers, yeah, mm. make make a stand because it's all well and good hyping it up online and Glazers out and this and that and that's it. We're finished, blah, blah, blah. Do something about it then. Yeah, because again, there's going to be loads of people that are going to say what you said. Right, okay, Jim, we'll give him a chance. We'll see what he does. By that time, he's already got his feet under the table, and now it's hard to get him out as well as the Glazers out. Now you've got two issues because if you don't deliver what he says, and you don't make Man United up there and challenging and being great again, now you've got two problems at that football club: the Glazers and Sir Jim Radcliffe. Yeah, so mm. for me, I, I think you lot need to nip it in the bud real quick, mate. Yeah, we've seen other clubs around the world. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm condoning Ajax smashing their stadium up. By the way, they're fans, mm. but you you can make a stand. Yeah, you can you can get games called off. You can protest properly. Valencia did it. Yeah, Valencia wanted their their owner out. Yeah, albeit he's not there, but all of a sudden they're now currently up in the top near the top of the table. They've spun it around because thirty five thousand Valencia fans outside the ground while the game's on last season. Yeah, all of a sudden that's beamed around the world. Yeah, Man United fans doing a little protest for tickets and this and that outside the ticket office the other day, all wearing the new shirt. Yeah, like. <laughs> all walking in the stadium, no wonder that they're going down this route of, oh, we'll just get Jim Radcliffe in. If Man United fans you know, yeah, en masse but... protested properly, yeah, instead of just trying to be, oh, well, I'm, oh, well, well, I'm here now, I want to watch the game, go in the mm. ground, scan your ticket to get in and walk out en masse. Remember Liverpool um, when they tried putting the price up to 72 quid a ticket 
few years back, they played Sunderland. They had 10, 15,000 Liverpool fans all walked out in the 72nd minute. They were 2 0 up in that game and ended up drawing 2 2. The next day, FSG said, I think it was FSG, said, no, nah, we're not putting the ticket price up because that's beamed all around the world. It's embarrassing, damaged their product. Yeah, they're taking money out of that club year in, year out. You're in debt as a football club, which isn't a massive issue because of the amount of revenue you have coming in. They can still spend, which they have more than any team in the Premier League, but damage their product. Don't buy anything. Don't buy the pie at half time. Don't yeah. buy a pint. I, yeah, going 25,000 Man United fans all walking yeah, out in the 25th I, minute. I agree. Yeah, I, I, 25%. I, 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 Sky yeah. Sports will lap that up. They love their so, drone yeah, above every one of them yeah, outside so, the so, so, Lee, just to interject for a second, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I do. Um, I'm still. I protest every single day because I've pulled every single piece of financial support away from Man United and I still advocate that. I do still believe that fans, if they, it, again, this is when you see what people really want. There's a comedian called Kai Kurd. I don't know if you follow him on, on Instagram, really funny guy. I did a podcast with him years ago and he had this great joke where he basically said, if you want to see if people are true, like he was talking about politics, but he said, if you want to see if people really care about that thing they're protesting, Hold the protest at 8.30 a.m. on a, a rainy Monday morning and see who turns up. Then you'll see people that really care about that cause because it's very easy to go into London on a warm summer's afternoon and go to a protest, right, as an example. It's much harder on a freezing cold, wet, rainy Monday morning. And it's a joke. It's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but there is an element of truth to it which makes a lot of comedy funny. And this is the same principle for me. This is when you really see whether people are against the Glazers because they truly believe the Glazers are bad for the club or whether or not they're just drunk jumping upon whatever is the most fashionable bandwagon. And the reason those fans annoy me is because I consistently bemoan the Glazers. I consistently call them out. I cancel things that I love. I haven't taken, especially my eldest son who loves football, I haven't taken him to a Man United game yet. He's nearly nine. And for me as a parent, I'm sad about that. I'm, I'm genuinely sad that I haven't taken my son to watch them play yet. But I believe, and I say this to him all the time, it's son, it's, I mean, I can't control what, 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 he's, what his family over in Ireland do for him because, again, that's weird, right? But for me, it's very much, they haven't taken him to a game, by the way. But for me, I'm not doing it because I don't believe it's right. And I'm explaining it to him. And I hope as he gets older, and I think he will, understand that what I'm doing, in my opinion, is a better form of love than saying, oh, I've got to go and cheer the boys on. So I agree with what you're, where you're coming from, but the problem is, bruv, is that most of these Man United fans, match going, day tripping, a lot of people online, I think they care, but only care to a certain degree. And how do I know this? Because the amount of them that I've had debates about, even just in our YouTube world, forget everybody else, just in our YouTube world, the amount of Man United fans who only ever focus on sacking managers or selling one or two players thinking that will resolve the problems at the club tells me they don't truly dislike the Glazers. Because if you did and you researched it, your main focus wouldn't be managers and players. It couldn't be. It would be an impossibility for you to focus on them as the main problem at the club. So I don't personally think that any more than 10% maybe 15% of Man United fans truly hold the Glazers accountable for where we are. I actually believe they only jump on the bandwagon. They only jump on the bandwagon when it's the fashionable thing to do. Outside of that, it's sell this player or buy this individual or sack this manager and hire this dude and we will be successful again. We've seen it for 10 years straight. They've been wrong every single time, and that isn't going to change. And what so they you only need 15% of the match day fans in the stadium, which is what? You've got 70,000 in the ground? Yeah, that's 10,000 people. You only need them 15,000 to walk out. Uh, sorry, 15% to walk out. So, so uh, yeah. what I'll say is this. I don't, when it comes to the match day going fans, I think the percentage is less. I'm talking Man United fans in general around the world. Of the match going fans that truly blame the Glazers, Two, three, four percent, genuinely. And they're the ones who have, have already given up their tickets. Everyone that goes to games can't truly believe the Glazers are the problem. You can't. You can't truly believe they're the issue and they're only there for money and give them money. I just cannot believe, but they can't say it publicly. They can't go, I don't think the Glazers are that bad because they get cooked. But if you're going to games, if you are financially supporting them, I just don't believe in your heart of hearts you can truly believe that they are damaging your club because I don't believe that you can think that but go, I'm still going to fund you, though. I just don't see... That doesn't compute to me as a person. Yeah. Like, no, I agree. Doesn't people, with me. 
the, the argument is, and we had this with the Cronky and Cronky out debate years and years back when they when we were being like Wenger out, Wenger in, Cronky in, Cronky out. It's like if you don't like the owner, don't give them your money, don't pay for your ticket. But then the argument to that, which is Man United fans are saying the same, yeah. But if I give up my ticket, someone else will have it. And what? You give up your ticket, you've done your bit. Yeah, but you can't give up your ticket because you want to look like the top is the top reds when you go to a game put it all over your insta or your youtubes or whatever it may be and i'm not digging out anybody in particular i'm talking about in total or show your mate so look i was at old trafford when we beat this team and blah blah but you're giving them money and you don't like them i don't like you here's a grand yeah oh by the way i'm gonna spend 100 <laughs> quid and, i'm gonna spend 100 quid and buy the shirt and put rashford on the back like bro, make bro, it make bro, sense bro, but then bro, the argument deep, is deep, somebody deep, else deep, to buy deep, it deeply imagine that in any other walk of life Imagine happen. any other walk of life where you despise what these people are doing to you and you continue to give them money. Bar and again, the only thing that I'd say fair is paying your tax wherever you live because you got prison, right? So the, you literally lose your liberty if you don't do it. I'm talking about things that you volunteer to do, which is most consumption. You, 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 just, you don't need to do it. JS here says something that's interesting. He says, Terry, bro, you can contradict yourself sometimes. You say your owners create scenarios in which fans buy shares when they think things are going well, Qatari takeover. Even you said you bought shares. Firstly, I was being sarcastic. So that's <laughs> it. Okay. However, the second thing is, if you do buy shares and make money out of the stock market, none of that money goes into Manchester United. Yes, you're feeding the Glazers, as an example, but you're not feeding them directly through Man United. So it isn't the same thing. But no, I, I didn't buy those shares. It was a bit of a sarcastic yeah, comment. Yeah, but if you don't like the Glazers and you're feeding them, even if... No, no, I agree, I agree. And that's why, that's why I wouldn't do it, personally. Um, but some people do. Uh, this year from I Cut My says, uh, Hi, Terry and Lee. Devastated for the Man United fan to see the Glazers staying. They were just too soft. Should have done the same as Ajax fans, but uh, uh, you were spot on boycotting them years ago, Terry. Of course I was. And, and again, it's not because I'm... This is a thing. I've said this so many times before. It's not because I'm smarter than other fans. It isn't because I love the club more than other fans. It's just because it's so basic. If you believe that somebody's only motivation is money, they are the easiest people in the world to control. And we see this all the time around the world. If companies are sponsored by certain people and there are issues in, in parts of the world that involve that sponsor, have you noticed that businesses don't call them out? So that's how I'm going to phrase that, right? We don't need to get any deeper than that. Everybody that's interested in making money is controlled by that pursuit of money. So therefore, <laughs> therefore, you pull the money. And if Man United fans would sacrifice their own personal desires, their own personal wants and needs, going to games, the Instagram post with the shirt on, the fashion accessory that is Man United, if they could forego that personal, individual, un- unrequired pleasure it's not a needed pleasure you know if you need the social the social element just go to the pub with the same people go to the cafe with the same people like go go around one of their houses you can still do all the same things so some people say it's for mental health you can still hang around with people you just don't need to go into the ground and give them your money give the money to local businesses that are struggling the point is this if man united fans for six months pulled their money away from manchester united the glazers would 110 percent be gone the only thing that man united fans haven't tried we've protested we've broke into stadiums we've hashtagged we've been on the news we've done everything but the only other than the only thing that will work and that's pull money and man yeah, united you protested to a certain degree you ain't protested properly standing outside like forget the super league right actual glazer protests you had one block in the club shop the other day or the other week you had one block in a ticket office the other week like few hundred people there terry yeah if you want to protest protest properly yeah like you did with the super league that's, that's it they don't this is the thing bruv they don't like i'll just say it outright they don't care uh this year says uh did uh, we'll come back to that one in a minute uh <laughs> watch when sir jim gets it right terry says i knew it, it would all along well again let me just resp- I'll, we'll respond to that by saying this and lee will advocate this i've said before that if man united get the right people running the club we can still become very successful. Do you know how I know that? Because between 2005 and 2013, we won 
five or six Premier Leagues, a Champions League, got to two other Champions League finals, won the FA, uh, didn't actually win the FA Cup, but we got the three finals in that time and won three or four League Cups. So the Glazers being at the club with the right people running it can still ye- yield success. So I'm not saying this cannot make us successful again, but do I believe we'll ever get back to our consistent best with the Glazers being here, running the show day in, day out, week in, week out? No, I don't. But if they do give all this power to Sir Jim, and he does hire the right people, of course it can go right. I'm just skeptical as to whether it will. I haven't said it's a complete impossibility, and I've always been very, very clear on that. Uh, so, Terry, Man United fans should do – what should Man United fans do now? Riot. Well, I'm not yeah. advocating for any kind of rioting, any kind of physical <laughs> damage, any kind of people getting hurt. That is not what I would ever advocate for. Man United fans are free to do whatever they want. If you're like me and you still want the Glazers out, pull your money. If you're like me and you want the Glazers gone – Boycott the football club in every single financial capacity that you possibly can. Direct money to the club it only needs to be. You don't need to, you know, I had a friend of mine, he's a good friend of mine, he's a United fan. He goes, bro, but I love my golf and my cricket and I need Sky Sports. I went, well, don't give it up then. That's fine. Don't damage other sports that need your money. Just got to remember how financially in trouble clubs were just with no match going fans for a year because of COVID. So that's just without that. Imagine you boycott the sponsors. And you boycott shirts and you boycott going to games. That's enough to ruin them. It's enough to ruin them and lower the arc, lower the valuation of the football club even further. The reason why they're holding out for eight, nine, ten billion for the football club is because they believe that's the price it's going to get to in the coming years. So you have to do everything in your power to make that not happen. So they sell now. That's, that's if you want them out. But if you're happy with them staying, then continue as you are, and that's your choice. And everyone's free to do what they want. Uh, Terry, I'm still waiting to get Lee. And the, the title cha- uh, challenger, Henry, on the same show. We'll try and do that next week, actually. We'll try and do that next week. I'll reach out to Henry and see what he's doing uh, next week. Uh, this here says, uh, from Full South, let's see how it goes. I hear you on I'm that. Saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, let's see how it goes. And this is the problem. There's way too many football fans that have infested Man United and Arsenal and other clubs that are just, oh, well, let's see how it goes. Yeah, let's see how it goes. And then before you know it, you're 10 years down the road and there's another 10 years you've been crap. Yeah, over there, we've got to try and get him out. Now we've got to try and get yeah. this one out. And like, how about make a stand? All right, but they don't. Yeah. They, they want to look like the toppest of top fan online. It's pathetic. And then when but people is- stick their head above the parapet, yeah, they're seen as toxic and negative. It's like, mate, in 10 years' time, you'll catch up. <laughs> I usually um, have a hard time agreeing with Lee, but he's 100% right about United, is what Sonny says. Uh, RIP to my fellow uh, 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 Swedish uh, who lost their lives yesterday. Yeah, heartbreaking news um, about the, uh, the the terrorist attack that happened. It was in Sweden, I believe, where two people were shot dead. I think one is in wow. critical condition. Um, before, I think it was even, dur- during a game. I think it was outside the stadium, but during a, a game near the stadium. I haven't read enough of the stories to be fair, so if I've got that wrong. I apologize. But yeah, uh, shocking, shocking, shocking news. Um, absolutely. United fan here. It makes me laugh. All these fans and channels now are trying to spin the Glazers staying as a positive. The club is dying. Last now is done. Hey, that's what they do, though. They like most of them, not all of them, but most of them. Same with most football clubs. Right, they will go and jump on whatever's getting the most traction. And that's it. Now this is getting traction, the Jim Radcliffe route, and all the media loveys out there putting out all the prop. Now they'll jump on that and spin it. Oh, well, it could be good. It could be good. Like, for two days ago, you were saying, man, you buried, it's finished, it's done, it's greed, it's it, because that was getting traction. Yeah, and people, people just go with what's, what's trendy, isn't it? Hear you on that. I love the mental gymnastics here. Terry backs Ten Hag. Ten Hag backs to Jim Ratcliffe. This implies Terry backs to Jim Ratcliffe. <laughs> yeah, that, that, again, Ratcliffe I know, you, you, I know you're saying it as a joke. That's how what I call basic bitches think. That's like a basic four-year-old's mindset. My daughter Freya is five. She thinks beyond that. That is a joke. It's funny. Like, and I give you that. I know you're joking by the emoji. But some people actually, I actually, I actually speak to grown-ups who think like that. Like genuinely, like you agree with one thing that one person has said or done once, that means you agree with everything. I don't know. The world is the world is yeah, most of them support both of our football clubs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lee, be humble and respectful. Footy gods, are, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that one a little bit later when we get onto that subject, my bro. Uh, did you see Paul Parker saying uh, that uh, Goldbridge is a massive problem because he isn't happy 
with the gym deal. I um, did read. I haven't I seen read. it, but he can I read say the article. Once he's played for Man United. Well, Paul Pogba turned around and basically, yeah, it, it, sorry, Paul, Paul Parker. Parker, sorry, has, <laughs> has turned around and basically said that people like he, he called Goldbridge and Norwich a, a Nottingham Forest fan. And basically said that he's saying that he isn't happy. Like Mark not being happy about Sir Jim. Paul Parker is saying that he's only a fan. He's never played the game. He hasn't he, he hasn't ever worked at the football club. Basically saying that his opinion doesn't count for anything because he's a fan given an opinion. I mean, what, what do you make of ex-footballers and professional pundits saying that people like you and me, for instance, because we didn't work for Man United, shouldn't be upset about the way our clubs are run? Well, he, he think that one person, not not me and you. So <laughs> he think that one person. Yeah, yeah, but, he, he, yeah, but, he, yeah. but what, did he say, what he said about him, Lee, was he's a fan. And because he's a fan, his opinion shouldn't carry any weight. No, he, he, can, have his, he can have his opinion all day long. Don't mean Paul Parker has to agree with it. Yeah, the same as I'm pretty sure there's people that don't agree with yours or, or my opinion. Like players watch it. Now, we all know they watch stuff. We all know they see stuff. Yeah, there's probably loads of my, like I said to you the other day, Zinchenko blocked me on Instagram. Yeah, I've never I've never mentioned the guy apart from on YouTube, so he must have watched YouTube and then blocked me on Insta. Yeah, so they watch it. Yeah, they can say what they want. He can do what he wants. Goldbridge can do what he wants. He can do what he wants. <coughs> at the end of the day, <coughs> excuse me. At the end of the day, yeah, like they don't like the fan media. Yeah, they don't like that because especially with that particular channel, he gets. God knows how many views every month. So they won't like it. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that what Goldwood is saying is right. Yeah, and he's entitled to his opinion, isn't it? Well, what, what, what Goldbridge has essentially said is what you said, that it's bad for the club and we've got to protest more and it's we wanted a full... Everything yeah, you've criticised Man United for, he has done... Can I stop with, you yeah. right there? Can mm. I stop you right there? On that basis, is he pulling out the key to... I can't remember his name. Um, who's got the VIP press pass interview Bruno Fernandes the other day. That goes to every game. Is he pulling him out then if he cares that badly? So why, why, would he, why would he need to because pull he, his he don't like the Blazers. We need players. to protest. We need to boycott. We need to do X, Y, Z. But then you're going to send your guy who's paid for, you've got the tickets paid for, and now he's got a press pass and he's going to interview the X, Y, Z. Makes no sense. So, he, so, so you're saying, so you, so you're saying that Mark, Mark Goldbridge, because he's against the Glazers, shouldn't have his reporters and journalists at press conferences and asking questions about the football club still? Yeah, but they're not asking the questions about the football club, are they? They're not asking about Glazers, are they? It's not well, sitting there saying, how comes we've done X, Y, and Z? How comes this happened? Well, I've, to, they, they, definitely ask questions. they definitely ask questions about the club. I've heard Adam do it. I've heard Adam, Adam. I know Adam, not that well, but I know Adam well. I've heard Adam call, like, question things and challenge things. He was, I swear he asked a question to Onana the other day about his start at the club and how poor he's been. He's under pressure. So they definitely ask tough questions. But you think that Goldbridge should pull all these staff out from Man United Events, if, games, he cares, if, he cares, if he cares so badly about what's happening at the club, then yeah, of course he will. Let's be real with it. Let's not dress it up here, Tell. You feel so badly about the club. You ain't spent a penny on it for how long? Years. You, you stopped your season ticket and this and that. So if you care so badly about it, stop going. So you can't, I, say, I, you I, can't on one hand say on. it's a disgrace, this, this, this and this on one hand. And then on the other hand, I have somebody going in the ground every week. <laughs> Come on, mate. Like, so, so for me, I understand. I think buying he can tickets. Do what he wants. It's none of my business. But well, what I'm I, saying is, no, just called out. I, I, I agree on the buying tickets. I, I agree with that notion because I, I advocate for it. I don't think they should, but I, I don't necessarily think that he should pull his staff out from having access to whether it be just Man United games or football grounds in general because they still get. To, I would still rather see fan media interview players and ask questions of the manager and challenge more so than the mainstream media that we know are completely and utterly nine times out of 10, barring a couple of people, they're almost so in bed. We, we saw the way Michael Owen interviewed Howard Webb the other day. It was just, it was an atrocity. So I'd much rather see the United stand, the United view these channels interviewing the players and asking them questions more so than with the mainstream media. But I do agree about not going to the games or giving any of your money to the football club as an example. That element I agree with. Where I disagree with Paul Parker, though, when we go back to the original point, is saying that because he's a fan, his opinion holds no weight and he essentially should shut up is ridiculous. That, that, that's the difference. It isn't that he's disagreed with Mark. He's saying that he shouldn't be allowed to give opinions. And I would think 
as two people that work in exactly the same industry as Goldbridge, we should be fervently against that. Because if that ever catches on and suddenly fans aren't allowed to give opinions anymore, me, me, and, you, me and you don't have a job. So we, we can't advocate that treatment of Mark Goldbridge because it indirectly impacts us as well. And for me, I think as fan media, on, it doesn't matter if you agree with Mark on anything. I stand by what he does for a job, the same as I stand by you, what you do for a job, Robbie, what he does for a job, Saeed, what he does for a job, because the reason these people are kicking off is because they don't have the influence and power they once did as pundits or as journalists. And our industry continues to grow and grow and grow because I think generally speaking, our viewers <laughs> find us far more authentic. So I'll stand by Mark Goldbridge on this 110% because it's just another slide dig because he's generally speaking got better opinions about football than these old heads that don't know what they're talking about anymore. After them, and you call your, you you call. Hang on, man. You call out your legends. Nearly every well, not every show, but you must have done in the last two years since we've done this show. Called out your club I'm legends. Do so, not all of them. Okay, the I'm ones not. that speak about your club publicly. You, Ian Wright, Ray Parler, Parler, Martin Keown. All, you've all called out them. Alex Scott. You've called out. Alex I've heard you call out loads of your Alex, legends for their bad Alex opinions. Scott. Yeah, Alex Scott Cool. Yeah. But that's four people, Terry. Yeah. Number one, she didn't play for the men's team, she played for the women's team. What's yeah. that got to do with anything? Well, it's not you're saying I called out the legends. To me, she ain't a legend. Yeah, because I ain't interested in women's football. Well, okay, yeah, but so she's you still called her I'm out. But, she, <laughs> but you, you would agree that she was a very good professional football player, right? Well, I'd, I'd agree on paper, yeah, when you see what okay. she's won. I've never but watched this, it. Okay. So, so she was, okay, let's just agree. She was a professional footballer. I think she was very good. You've disagreed with, like, yeah, her opinions about your it. club. And you talk about how much nonsense these people speak about Arsenal, yet suddenly Paul, Paul Parker's opinion about Man United holds more weight than Goldbridge's because he was an ex-professional footballer. That sounds hypocritical that. to me. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, yeah, Paul Parker can say whatever he wants, and so can Goldbridge. I said that about five minutes ago. Yeah, if he's calling out, oh, because he's a fan, this, that, and the other, yeah, cool. That's his opinion, isn't it? Yeah, I don't see Martin Keown, Ian Wright, or um, Ray Parler saying, oh, yeah, well, because of them being a fan, they're not allowed to say what they want. No, I've never seen him say that. Ray, Ray, Parler, Ray, pa Ray Parler called out AFTV back in the, the lockdown period and basically said that they're bad for the club. They shouldn't be given so much oh, of a voice. In <laughs> no, he's not. He's not. And I know you don't like AFTV, but they're, they're, no, they're not. Football, you can disagree with Robbie's opinion. You can disagree with Turkish's opinion. You can disagree with uh, who else? Uh, Cecil's opinion. But the idea they shouldn't be allowed to do it is what I'm debating here. Not agreeing or disagreeing with what they've said. I don't care if Paul Parker says Goldbridge has got a wrong opinion. I disagree with Goldbridge. It's that he shouldn't have as big a voice because he's a fan. That's the element I'm challenging here. Not do we agree with each other's opinions. Saying they shouldn't get a platform. They shouldn't have the reach. They shouldn't have the power they have. I don't think they actually have any power. They're just, generally speaking, the better your opinions, the more people watch you. That's typically on social. rubbish. Generally speaking, in Absolute my view, rubbish. No, right. no, it's not. The more you twerk and go with what's fashionable, the quicker you will grow a following. Not only that, the more nah. positive you are, yeah, the quicker you'll grow a following. Absolute rubbish, Terry. Do, do, the, do you want to know why I disagree? Do you want to know why I disagree? Do you want to know why I disagree with that, though? Do you want to know why I disagree with it? In the short term, maybe so. And I give you an example, and you've called this out. So why I would agree with you. Maybe yes on Twitter. Maybe yes on TikTok, very short format levels of content. But you know, there's big names on Twitter and there's big names on TikTok. How many of them actually are successful when it comes to longer format content and actually speaking about their football club? None. And that's because when you are, um, when you're not authentic and it's all just for like basic clicks, there is no sustainability in what you do. I'm talking about genuine, what I call genuine content creators that do what you do. The ones who, are just saying things for the sake of it. They've got no lifespan and they they, 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 they they come and go very, very quickly. The people who have genuine opinion, yes, they have some funny moments and they have some bad takes, but the, someone like Mark Goldbridge is only where he is now because so many people enjoy his opinions on football. And yes, they find elements of him entertaining. But if he was just a joke that they like to laugh at, They'd only ever watch him when he was ranting or Man United were losing. This guy could literally do a video where he's sitting in a room doing nothing and half a million people would watch him. That is because they, there's something about him they enjoy. So for me, as I say, they're I think... Generally... They, they want the entertainment. They want a bit of drama here and there. But that's why people tune into this show. They want a bit of me and you arguing with each other. 
Yeah, so they're tuning in every Tuesday in the hope that we have a big argument. No, they, they <laughs> part like they part, yeah, but that's part of it, Lee. They, they tune into me and you every week, and we have a bit of a row. But when you actually read the comments, they enjoy it. Some people don't like your opinion. Some people don't like my opinion. But they enjoy the fact that we have the, the opinions and we go deeper. It isn't just some 30-second nonsense video on TikTok, which gets a laugh, and then they scroll on and forget about you forever. So I do think, you know, the reason why you're successful and you have a lot of followers is because there is a lot of people that agree with your view of football. So I, I think you're even being dis I think you're even being a little bit um, self-deprecating about yourself, mate, like on, on, a, on a real level. And, you know, I've got what I've got follower wide. Doesn't mean I'm, I, I know more about football than you. Some of it is presentation. Some of it is how you come across. Some of it is, I think if you'd have started a channel, which was Lee Gunner reacts covering more than just Arsenal, I think you'd be even bigger than you are now. Like when you just do one club, it typically is harder other than like one or two people that have done crazy, crazy numbers in that space. But yeah, look, I, I just think people like Paul Parker calling out Goldbridge and saying they shouldn't have opinions is, is, is wrong really uh, for, for me. Um, some more super chats here. Uh, Terry Goldbridge needs to lead by example. How can you protest a club that you are uh, doing business with? Make zero sense. You are waffling. Shout out to both of you. Well, when you say doing business with, are you, are you suggesting that the, the United stand is being paid by the Glazers, paid by Manchester United? I, I, there's no evidence or proof that they're getting any kind of payment from the club. Mark Goldbridge slags the owners off far too much for there to be some kind of payment or agreement between the two of them. It, it wouldn't make any sense, uh, in my personal opinion. Uh, this uh, We'll come back to some of the ones about Arsenal later. Uh, Lee, did you see that PGMOL reached out to Terry for his clickbait titles? That <laughs> 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 It weren't clickbait. I, I, I literally yeah, quoted... I, 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 if they actually reached out to you? Yeah, they emailed me. No, I, I put an, I put, <laughs> uh, my, no my, way! My, my title of a video was We Cheated Arsenal in quotations. And they so asked him why I did you. that. Yeah, they emailed me saying it made you made it sound like Howard Webb said it. I said, did you watch the video? They said no. I said, watch the video. I watch it from London. Like, watch it from four minutes so and so. It's terror. It's, it's me making a statement that that's what I heard when you gave your explanation. They came back to like, the PGMOL. That's crazy. <laughs> but imagine being like, titles, wait, though, imagine <laughs> imagine being angry about something you haven't watched. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah, imagine imagine having the audacity to email you when they haven't watched it. That's a bit random. See, Mate, that's where I would have like the Paul Parker go. They can say what they want. They can do what they want. Yeah, right. But if you're going to kick off, right, about a title of a video that you haven't watched, yeah, at least have a bit of shame, mate. Like, watch the video and then have an opinion on it. Yeah, of course. Of course, well, like, like again, I, I didn't even know this. Happened. No, it was this last week. Like... Last week, so that's really funny. My YouTube manager, who obviously works for Google in London. I sent it all through to him, and his words were, I told you that's the best way to title your videos. So that's what always makes me laugh when I get accused of things. YouTube were the ones that show me how to title things. Like my actual YouTube manager goes, no, change it to this, do this. So when people go, oh, you're, you're bullshitting, you're lying, no, that's what YouTube tell you to do. So it's, you know. you got the same manager as I have, right? Sorry? Same YouTube manager as I have. We're both yes. Same, I, think, we? I think we may have the same YouTube, yeah. yeah I ignored okay. him for about 11 months because I thought it was spam. <laughs> no, no, he's good. He's very good. <laughs> he's very, very good. He's very, very good. Uh, this year says Twaddle United fans have to put massive protests on over the Glazers' tenure. Uh, what are you talking about? They, they have put some big protests on, but then they go into the stadium. They need to protest with their wallets. It's far more impactful. Uh, this year says thoughts on the Tony and Tonali betting situation. I, I tweeted this earlier. I said that Ivan Tony needs to sue the Premier League. It's not just Tonali. Howard, uh, Harry, uh, I think you pronounce his name, is it uh, Toffolo? Are being for me, they're being treated purely as mental health victims when it comes to betting and gambling. But Tony was painted out to be some sort of disgrace to the sport. We haven't got all the details around what Tonali has done yet. Yes, the poker and the gambling in casinos has nothing to do with football. But there are, this is a very deep allegation of up to 40 people in Italy to look at what it is he may or may not have done. And maybe everything's come out. Maybe it's nothing to do with football with, with Tonali. But the way that both Harry and Tonali are being looked at as mental health victims, and I understand it. So a lot of people view gambling as an addiction and they need help. And I, and I respect that. But the way that Ivan Tony has been spoken about as a, like a, a, a someone who's damaged football and he's not being, being treated as a victim in this, in the same way these two are, for me, is dis is disgusting, and I if I was him, I'd be hiring a good group of lawyers to sue everybody involved, because for me, I don't think the treatment has been equal. 
I don't think the media coverage has been equal. And I, Ivan Tony, in my opinion, should be suing people because the way he's been portrayed is is an utter disgrace, in my opinion. Disgraceful. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree, mate. That's all right. He will uh, he will just get his head down and start banging goals in for Arsenal in January. Happy days, isn't yeah. it? I'm sure he will. Uh, can't wait. Uh, we'll come to Chelsea and the Arsenal stuff in a little bit. We'll come back to those super chats on that uh, soon. Um, I want to ask you a question. Is Erling Haaland the best player in the world right now? He's not even the best player at City. I ask you because all I've seen on my TL for the last 48 hours is compilations of why he should be the Ballon d'Or winner and people praising him, talking about what a great footballer he is. But then the counter-argument is he's a bang-average footballer. No, His footballing ability is, is poor. He's becoming this season like a flat-track bully when it comes to even goal-scoring. I just wanted to kind of get your take on the idea of someone like Harlem winning the Ballon d'Or. And is it a bad look, in your opinion, for football? Yeah, because he ain't the best player in the world. Like, he's, he's literally just a, a goal machine. Yeah, and if you don't if you don't put him a chance on the plate inside the penalty box, he ain't scoring it. It don't have to. What well, I say on the on a plate, he turns half chances or quarter chances into goals in a penalty box. But he ain't a great footballer. He ain't really got much ability. Let's be real with it. Like there's better footballers out there that just don't have the output in front of goal. In front of goal, he's he's ridiculous. Yeah, his movement, the way his brain thinks in a penalty box, but outside the box. How many t- I think he had 23 touches against us the other week. And we're supposed to think this guy's the best in the world. He had 23 touches in 90-odd minutes, mate. Like, come on. Yeah, these people are doing too much, man. But they look at the numbers, isn't it? Yeah, the goals output. And they go, oh, he's the best. Well, he's not, is he? Yeah, Leo Messi should have won it every year since he debuted for Barcelona. Best player in the world every single year. Yeah, ability-wise, passing-wise, scoring assists all this you could put it all together vision weight of pass yeah dribbling everything you could put all of that and messi's been the best player ever since he debuted for barcelona ain't even close yeah and he hasn't got no skill set exactly he's just a goal scorer that's it yeah but a lot of people they just look at the stats oh he got the most goals he must be the best player don't work like that it don't work like that at all and I, he ain't winning it messi's winning it yeah, and rightly so. And then people have a meltdown. But, oh, how did he win it? Oh, Ronaldo scored 40-odd goals, most in 2023. Yeah, well, figure out how the Ballon d'Or works. Yeah, because it's not from the start of January to the end of December. So I don't know why people are still thinking it is. And every year, the same thing happens. People getting in their feelings. Like, oh, this player scored more goals this year than any... Who cares, mate? It don't go from... It don't do calendar years. Yeah, Messi won a World Cup. He was pivotal in winning that World Cup. He won a league title last season. What's the issue here? Yeah, do, do you know what's interesting about it is this comment here is an interesting one. It says the Ballon d'Or is about achievements, not technical ability. That's rubbish. And that was, as well. So again, but when we say that's rubbish, but is it? Is the Ballon d'Or about who is the most technically gifted footballer in the world, or is it about who has delivered the most, who has achieved the most? in the last year and then, like is is there somewhere a clear definition of of what do you get where i'm coming from because if if for instance that the the, the ballon d'or come out and say yeah it's about achievements as opposed to who's got the best technical ability then then you have to start looking at the stats and the trophies right because i've always, i've always thought it was about achievements because to your point if messi wins it and he wins it on his technical ability Unless the next year there's a player with better technical ability than Messi, he's just he's just going to win it every single year. And by that same point, then, then you almost don't need a vote and you don't need an award ceremony because the likelihood of somebody else coming in a year later who's got better technical ability is going to be very low when you're as good as Lionel Messi. I always felt it was meant to be about who has had the best achievements in a... I know, I know it's done in terms of seasons now, but it used to be who's had the most achievements in the last calendar year. Or, 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 no, or, no, or, no, or, or I misunderstood that this whole time. They've never, they've never stated what it is. They just said it's World Player of the Year. They haven't stated its achievements. If it's achievements, yeah, then um, what's his name? Um, Alvarez wins it. 
Alvarez wins it. He won a treble and a World Cup <laughs> and a Super Cup. <laughs> if we're going down this route of trophies again, and calendar again, years. Again, though, again though see, what, see, I think what's interesting about that is this. Alvarez, yes, he, he won those trophies. But when it's achievements, it isn't just did you pick the trophies up. It is how integral were you in terms of your country. So I think he was very important for, for uh, Argentina winning the World Cup. He's got some very important goals. Very good performances. In terms of the Premier League and the, everything else last year, he was involved, but he wasn't as heavily involved as a Rodri or a Jack Grealish or, of course, Erling Haaland last year. So I, I get where you're coming from, but you're looking at the individuals spearheaded those achievements. And to say that Haaland wasn't one of, like, what Haaland did last year from a goal scoring point of view eclipses everybody in Europe because he was the main goal scorer in a team that went on to win a treble. And that in itself is what I always felt the Ballon d'Or was recognizing. Who has been one? Who has been the best performing player in in the the best teams of the season that have achieved great things? That that's what I always thought it was. As opposed to we're going to judge it based on who has the best first touch and technical ability. I've, I've never because whenever, whenever they're listing off the reasons why somebody's won, they show the goals, they show the trophies, they they talk about them. They never say this guy's got the best first touch and this guy's the best dribbler and this guy's got the best vision. They never mention any of those things. It's always about the achievements of that individual player in the last 12 months. Or, or again, maybe I just haven't, maybe I've misunderstood the way they've even given the awards out. Man, the awards are popularity contest anyway. Let's just be real with it. It's just whoever's popular. Yeah, if, and if it, it's been like that for a long time. Like back in the day, Michael Owen won it. Was he the best player in the world? No. Yeah, I'm not saying he weren't great, by the way. Yeah, because at that time, mm -hmm. I think he was 21, 22. Yeah, he was unbelievable. But he weren't the best player in the world. Yeah, nowhere near the best player in the world back then. Yeah, like um, Pavel Nedved won it. Unbelievable footballer. Yeah, was he better than Thierry Henry that season? No. Why didn't Henry win it? Ronaldinho won it over Henry. Fair enough. You could say, yep. Yeah. But Nedved? Not for me. Like the whole thing's been a fast. Like Cannavaro won it. Yeah, I'm not saying he weren't a good defender. Of course he was. He was unreal. But was he the best player in the world? No. See, but again, but this is the this is the thing. Again, this is just my interpretation. I felt he won it because of how well he played in a World Cup that led to Italy winning it when they weren't expected to. And it was it was the the performances in that World Cup and the achievement of all of that is what made him win win that award and it's like listen i view it very much as and i think ability plays a part in, in who wins a ballon d'or but it's like me and you have worked in sales sometimes the person who might win sales person of the year isn't actually the best sales person in the business over a two three four five year period they just had a really good year and maybe they landed a deal that was so spectacular for the company that it's like it it, it gave them an accolade but the following year they're back down to where they were so i do think you can win ballon d'or's player of the year awards like would you say the same thing about the like premier league player of the year should that just be based on who is the best technically or who had the best individual season in terms of achievements, ability, outputs, consistency? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I'd say I'd say the same with team of the year. Like when people do team Premier League team of the year, we we sat on there the other, other month and did it like, uh, back in the last season. And team of the year is Man City's first 11. That's it. <laughs> yeah, because that is the team of the year, isn't it? If you're talking about player of the year, like... You know, and I said to you, that's a fast as well. Erling Haaland wins it. Cool, fair enough. You've won it. Right? But Bakayo Saka, who's the same age as Haaland, wins the young player of the year. Mm. Well, if he's the best player in the league, Haaland, right, according to your own announcement, here you go, Erling, you've won uh, Premier League player of the year. Well, surely on that then, he wins the young player of the year. It's all a load of rubbish. The whole thing. It's all right, mate. I've mm. I've not even bothered since Henri got robbed after Nedved done him. Yeah, I've not even bothered with it. Yeah, but Leo Messi should have won it every year since he's played football or broke into Barca's first team. Unbelievable footballer, and he's got all the accolades to go with it. Turns up most games. Ninety nine percent of games he turns up when he's when it's when it's on the line. Mm. Yeah, and he's the best player in terms of ability. So he's got the ability and he's got the, the accolades to go with it. Well, he should win it every year then. Yeah, I hear you on that. I hear, I hear where you're coming from. I need to go bathroom um, quick, mate, yeah? yeah? No worries. I get where you're coming from. I'm just intrigued by the way what people are saying it. Uh, Henri said, how many can you score from outside the box? <laughs> I like that. 
uh, allegedly the primary criteria is the players' individual performances in the previous season, uh, but the real criteria is how many judges you can buy. <laughs> but yeah, I, again, I do think it's about performances as opposed to technical ability. I, I always thought it was, um, but we now, and that's the, I spoke about this a lot on the terrace. Often people don't want to like, debate what the criteria are because then once a criteria is set, it removes debate, I suppose. And, and that's the issue. They want the debate, don't they, Daryl? Uh, Ray here uh, says, spot on Lee. Uh, Haaland is not the best player. Mbappe is closer to Messi than Haaland is to Messi. Plus, what has Haaland uh, done in the international scene other than sit and watch major tournaments? This is true. And Norway have failed to qualify again for the Euros. Comparing Haaland to Mbappe reminds me of Van Nistelrooy and Henri debates. Mbappe is far more uh, influential in build-up as well as having output. Yeah, listen, I, again, when people compare, like, again, and maybe this is, um, I, I think it's a modern-day phenomenon. No one, when people would say, who's better? That's probably, that's like a layman term. It's the wrong phrase. The argument should be who who's the more consistent, who performs the best, who scores the most, and who helps lead their team to more major trophies. That was how, when I was a kid, you worked out who the best was. Nobody, and I genuinely mean this as a kid, nobody said so and so is better because he's got better technical ability. You could actually admit and concede and say, I oh, know Henri's a better dribbler. I know he's got better first touch. But who actually delivered? It's like with boxing. If, if, Tyson Fury and AJ fight. Most I got a better one because they have fought. Anthony uh, Wilder and AJ. Sorry, Wilder and Tyson Fury. We all know Tyson Fury is a superior boxer. But if Wilder knocked him out three times running, who would you say the better the better fighter was? Who would you say is the better professional boxer? Just because um, uh, Tyson Fury would have been better technically wouldn't have made him a better overall fighter. And that, for me, is the difference here. And I, I reverse that scenario to try and paint a picture. Just because you're a better technical boxer, if you don't win the fights, you ain't better than the guys that are beating you. At the end of the day, technical ability is important, and I get why people love it. But I'm just saying the difference between my generation and the generation now is that people judge things on technical ability as opposed to or what they're achieving, what they're doing in their delivery. And I, I do find it intriguing. I do find it intriguing. Just very quickly as well about Thierry Henry. I may be wrong in saying this, because I can't remember exactly what year Nedved won it. But I'm pretty sure Henry scored 30 goals, 20 assists, all the assists that merchants out there. right? So he's got the output. I think, I think it was the year we'd done a double. Yeah, and I may be wrong. I'm pretty sure France won a World Cup. I may be wrong. No, you couldn't have won a world. They won the World Cup in '98, didn't they? They weren't. They were, but on a level, Henri not winning it that year. I, listen, I hated Henri at that point because Man United and Arsenal's rivalry was a point. And when he didn't win it, I remember laughing and going, "Ha!" Ah. But then, going on a real level though, I don't know how he didn't win it. Like genuinely, the guy was so good, and I thought, I thought he deserved it in every way, shape, or form. But there was always a feeling in England back then, that for English pe play, English based players, not English people, English based players to win it, it's always been seen as very, very difficult indeed for them, them to do it. But, but then Michael um, Owen won it. Oh, Michael right. did do well. Yeah, no, it, it has happened. It has happened. And, then, um, and this is why I discarded it after that. It was 2003. Fair enough, France didn't win anything that year. Right? But um, this is why I discarded it after that because it's like, you've got all the output. You're unbelievable. Yeah, and then somebody comes along who was equally as good, but in his in his own position, didn't have the accolades of that season, didn't get the output, but was a very gifted footballer as well in Nedved, and he wins it over this guy who's won the trophies, got the ability, yeah, spearheaded his team to a double. Like, right, come on, make it make sense. I, I, I just didn't bother. So in O three, so it was so it was it was O three. So O three though, Man United won the league though. Yeah, but it's from the season before, right? No, it was calendar years then. So 03 would have been the back end of the 02, 03 season and the first four months of the new calendar campaign. Years. I didn't think yeah, it was just calendar years. I, I thought it was. I always thought it was the calendar year. But if it was a season and it was 03, then that was a season that Man United won the league. I think that was off, I think that was off of the back of him doing a double, mate, in 02. Someone here saying 03. Okay, no. Okay, if it was 03, 04 in the Invincible season, the end of the year, then he deserved to win it. 
Okay, cool. I don't quite Maybe remember that. So he... Ronaldinho won it over him, and then Nedved won it over him. But I can't remember what, mate. I've taken so much antibiotics for this toothache. <laughs> I'm, I'm away with a Google fairy, search. I'm just going to Google search the winners here. It's probably the quickest way of doing it, to be fair. Let's have a little butcher's. Uh... No, it was 03. It was 03. Yeah, it was 03. So I'm pretty sure that's from the year before. Because it, I'm sure it's never been calendar year. Okay, so it's but, just here. Hang on, I'm going to read out. It's a 2003 Ballon d'Or uh, given is the best football player in Europe as judged by a panel of sports journalists. Uh, Wall did, 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 did Power of a Nedved in 2023. On November 03, the shortlist was announced. So the shortlist was announced on November 2003. So this is why I say it was calendar year because the previous winner won it the last December and they and then not until the following November where they give the new, new shortlist. So it's, it was done... A twelve-month increment. Do you get one coming from? You couldn't have. You can't unless they took the first last four months of the pre. The first four months of a season. I don't know. I, I, I was. I always think it was kind of. But either way, either way, if it's o three, that means that would be the last six months of a Premier League season. So the only trophies won in the period of time they're judging is when Man United won the league. Let's just click on Nedved for a minute though, because Nedved was very good that year. I just want to check one little thing. I'm checking these honors. That year, Juve won the... That year, though, Juve won the league, the Italian FA Cup, and they came second in the Champions League. So, again, on an achievement point of view, they'd done a double and got to a Champions League final where Arsenal that season... I don't know the answer to this, but Arsenal that season... Let's just have a look. The, the 0-3 season, what they win? They didn't. We obviously didn't win the league. Won the, you won the FA Cup that year. And I don't know where there's, you got in the Champions League. There's loads of people in this chat saying I'm confusing World Player of the Year and Ballon d'Or. Well, it's the same thing, isn't it? <laughs> no, there, there, there is different. There, I mean, I mean, now they've got the FIFA Best Awards, which is an even a different one again. Um, yeah, but I think I, I did used to think that it was calendar year Ballon d'Or, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Um, another quick player I wanted to ask you about as well was Cristiano Ronaldo. Now, I know you don't rate him particularly highly, but I'm, he's no player in world football has scored more goals in the last in 2023 than him. And he's, again, on an international... Again, I know not everyone rates the Saudi League, but on international duty, again, this man is banging in goals, 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 to a point, right? I read this stat about him. Since he turned 30, right, the amount of international goals that he has scored... I'm actually going to get the actual quotation here, right? Since he was 30. This is what's crazy, right? Ronaldo, since he was 30. Let me get this tweet up, right? So since he turned 30 years old... He's played four hundred um he's he's played four hundred and seventy games in total, scored three hundred and sixty-nine goals and got ninety assists, right? On an international from an international point of view, since being 30, he scored 73 international goals, and that would make him the highest goal scorer in 192 countries, including Spain, Germany, France, England, um, the Netherlands, Italy. Um, to score that amount of goals since being 30. This guy's just ridiculous. Like he'd be the leading goal scorer in all those countries if he started playing at 30. That's incredible. Have you seen the teams they've played? <laughs> so his goals don't count. I didn't say that. I just asked you a question. Have you seen the teams they've played? Right. They should be beating Iceland. They should be slapping Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Slovakia, Bosnia. Like, whilst it's great. They should be beating teams like that. Yeah, they should be beating Ghana, Nigeria. I'm going through their fixtures now. Yeah, they should be beating them. Yeah. As soon as they come up against Spain, they lost. Yeah, fair enough. They beat Uruguay. Um, they're half decent, I suppose. Yeah, but they, they should be beating the teams they're beating. Yeah, they slapped Luxembourg 6-0. They then slapped them 9-0. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, yeah, great, cool. But that's one of them stats out there for the Ronaldo fanboys to go, oh, look, it's amazing. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And not everyone can do that. I understand that. But come on, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> really? Like, they should but be the, winning these games. I guess not he, winning should the game, I he should so, be so, scoring. So when you say he should be, right, I, I look at it this way. In If you look at his last 10, 15 team, team scored against Bosnia, Bosnia, Slovakia, Iceland, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Ghana, Switzerland, who barely concede. Luxembourg, Qatar in a friendly, Ireland, France, Germany, Hungary that are hard to break down. 
Now, I know your point that you shouldn't... Well, Germany is the only real considered big nation in that then, right? France as well. And France as well. So it's two out twice. of the last 15. He scored, he scored twice against them. At the same time, though, all the big European teams all play the same level of European teams, generally speaking, because we all have a minnow or two in our, two in our groups. We all... Everyone, at least once every few years, gets a, a San Marino or a poor team like that. Why is nobody else, even now or before Ronaldo, scoring at this rate if it's a case of he should be doing it? Well, nobody else is 38 years old, Terry. Come back when Harry Kane's 38. <laughs> yeah. And stat padding against, I don't know, San Marino. But, but, th but this is the point I'm making. So players that are 10 years younger, 15 years younger, that you would probably say better technically, are playing against the same level of opposition and they are not scoring the same level of goals as Ronaldo. So when you it's say Ronaldo... Penalty boxes, Ronaldo. We've had this conversation millions of times. Ronaldo is an elite level goal scorer. We've, that's why he's scored more goals than anyone. Yeah, I don't know where we're going with this. He's an elite level goal scorer. But having said that, yeah, having said that, he should be scoring against all them teams you've read out, including Germany, because they ain't the Germany they used to be. France, you could say, wow, okay, cool. France, the top draw. Yeah, but the rest of them, come on, man, you could score against Luxembourg. The thing is, though, why is nobody again? If if it's so easy to do it, why why do so many strikers not score anywhere near this amount of goals? This guy's tracking towards a thousand goals in his career. Right. No one's ever why done. I've it. said he's the most elite goal scorer out there, unless you want to include Pele's goals in the army. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know where we're going with this. No, I mean I'm just talking to you about the way a lot of people are praising him for what he is now doing in 2023 at 38 years of age. How much no, praise people, you... are people are praising it, you know, from what I've seen, and it's only from what I've seen, people are praising it to base an argument that he should win Ballon d'Or. That's it. In terms we all know that he's scored over 800 goals. We all know that he's wanting to hit 1,000, which is why he's still playing. Yeah. How phenomenal of an achievement is it that to be 38 years of age still scoring at this volume of goals, which we've never seen anybody at this age, at this level do before. Yeah, it's mad. Yes, yeah, mate, I've got no issue with his outputs and all of that. I've said this to you before. He's an elite level goal scorer, the best goal scorer we've ever seen. My, my problem is he ain't the best footballer. So when people want to put him in the best footballer category, it's the same with Erling Haaland. Yeah, I think he's better than Erling Haaland by a mile, the country mile. <laughs> he's, he's miles clear of Erling Haaland, but it's the same premise. Loads of goals, yeah, not really a lot outside the box, although there's a massive age gap between the pair of them. But it's the same thing. Yeah, in a penalty box, you know Ronaldo is going to score 9 out of 10 that he gets. Yeah, outside the penalty box, not so good anymore. Yeah, so you find a way to play to his strengths, and that is what the teams are doing, which is why he's still scoring at that rate. Mm. Yeah, Lewandowski. Yeah, Lewandowski plays for a nation that's not considered as good as Portugal. Yeah. But if you look at Lewandowski's output, and he's 35, if you look at Lewandowski's output, you know, I bet he's still scored quite a lot of international goals over the age of 30. It's not on that level, but he's still scored quite a lot of international goals. And he's playing for a nation that ain't that great in terms of football. Yeah, like I mean, Lewandowski, Lewandowski, Lewandowski's got 81 in his entire mm. career, uh, as an example. He's 30, what you say, he's 36 or 35? 35. So 35, so one, two, three, four, five. In that five-year period, he scored 11, 13, 19, 23. He scored 26 goals since he turned 30, where, as I say, Ronaldo scored three times that amount. It's crazy. And he's playing for a better nation in terms of football. Yeah, if you look yeah, at that, that they've point. got a lot better players that are more um, higher up in terms of the clubs they play for. They're playing for better football clubs. So mm. on paper, better players, aren't they? Yeah, when you look at Portugal's team, yeah, compare it to Poland, but that's still a decent record. Oh, it's not Ronaldo record. Lewandowski, Lewandowski, Lewandowski ain't well better passed. in a penalty box than Ronaldo. Let's just be real with it. No, he's not. He's not on Ronaldo's level. One hundred and ten percent. I just thought it was interesting. Again, I the goals that he's scoring in Saudi. I'll be honest with you, the goals. <laughs> but they're, they're, it's, for me, I'm 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 not being disrespectful. Ronaldo fans are going to hate this. It's, it's like Lionel, all Lionel Messi's goals and assists that are coming in, in, in MLS. I, they're not that impressive to me. It's For me, it's not a level. It. You still have to do it. But you still have to do it. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Yeah, I, I watched... Um, I, yeah. I, I see something during the rounds the other day. Jordan Henderson's team yeah, went away to... I can't remember who they were playing. There was 900 fans in the crowd. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like... 
it's not the league that the Premier League is, yeah, which is no. why you have to rate Ronaldo's output, and I always do. I just re- don't rate him that highly as a footballer overall. But his output can't be questioned. I've said this a million yeah, times. Yeah, and right? I think what's interesting, what people got to understand, you, that's, many because, leagues. That's, that's because you don't view footballers from a professional standpoint of their ability, their outputs, their consistency, and what they've achieved. You typically, typically view it on how you subjectively view their skills and their touch and how they look on your eye, which I understand. And I I suppose it's just that I look at it more from a, what did someone achieve? How long do they keep going? How well do they perform in games? Their moments, their iconic moments. I kind of look at all of that and go, yes, I agree that Joe Bloggs has got better, a better first touch and better dribble or, or better range of passing. But overall, this guy achieved more as a pro. It's like I mentioned earlier with fighting. You could be the best technical boxer in the world, bob and weave like a madman. But if you don't knock out the champions and win those world title belts, in my opinion, you're not as good a boxer as the guy that's gone and done that at the end of the day. People say penalties don't count. Like somebody in the chat earlier said, yeah, but Harlan, uh, sorry, Messi got seven penalties at the World Cup and this and that. When, uh, 12 of Ronaldo's goals in, in this calendar year have been penalties. They still count. Oh, I, I do still think... Well score. How many penalties do we see ballooned I, out of the stadium? I, I do, I do believe Kane? in free... I believe in free speech, but I do believe that Elon Musk and the people at Google, anyone who turns around and, and says things like non-penalty goals, you should be instantly banned from talking about football. <laughs> well, I said hey, you shouldn't ban fans. The the whole, but their penalties suddenly are not. Again, that all started with Bruno Fernandez. He was the first player ever I saw ridiculed for scoring penalties. It was so weird. Uh, but there we go. Uh, CR7 is a goal scorer now, uh, but he was an elite footballer in his early years at Madrid and at United. He was ridiculous, especially in 13 14. He absolutely was Tony Bloom. Uh, Rodri, Gundawan, and KDB more deserving than Harlan. Rodri, Gundo, yeah, yeah, I could see all three of them, even Alvarez as well. Like, but for, for City alone, I wouldn't put out. Yeah, I love this here. Media dictates who wins the Ballon d'Or. But it's, it's literally run by the French Journalistic Association. So it's without sounding disrespectful to the Super Chat, it's literally voted for by journalists. Of course, the media dictates who wins it. It's literally a media reward. Uh, Ronaldo does not, hence why he is the contrast in player image. Messi paid the media. And I don't think he's paid the media. Again, I don't, I don't <laughs> Rodri should win it. Um, he won a trophy with Spain. Fair play. Um, yeah, the, tro- the trophy wasn't as big as the World Cup that Messi won. But no, it's true. He did win a treble, Messi didn't. So, I mean, this is the thing, it's too subjective, isn't it? Yeah, and there's always going to be people that say, oh, he was robbed or he was robbed. Like, I did it about Henri. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. You're never no, gonna, I, I agree. You're never going to sit there and universally everyone's going to go, yep, he fully deserves to win that this year. It's not yeah, going to happen. No, you, you, ne- you never get it. Uh, Terry, and I'm sure Lee would agree, both United and, and United, sorry, my, Arsenal and United owners are American and have teams in other sports. Um, I'm in Tampa. Glazers invest more in Tampa Bucks than United. Probably. Uh, they probably do. Um, the comment that came through in here, uh, th- th- we'll come back to some more of these Super Chats later. I haven't forgotten them. We'll come back to them. Uh, there's a comment earlier that said... Um, Terry, you've got to stop your Arsenal loving with your title saying that Arsenal will smash Chelsea. Want well, to let everybody know that title is based on what Lee turned around to me and said earlier, because your view is you, you you're going to give Chelsea a bit of a hammer in this weekend. You, 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 or I don't want to misrepresent you. You think you're going to give them a bit of a slap this weekend, Chelsea? Yeah, man. I think I think we're doing comfy. I think we're doing comfy. I think they'll score. Yeah, they they all those saying that. <laughs> they've they've won their last three games in all comps and they've scored what four against Burnley, two against Fulham, one against Brighton in the cup. International break probably come at the wrong time for them. You know, mm-hmm. now they there's doubts about some of their players whether they're gonna play at the weekend. I still think Cole Palmer a start. Yeah, and he's done all right in the last couple of games. Sterling's played all right this season, but I just don't really see where they're gonna score more than one goal past us, and I think we'll score at least two. Yeah, and I think it'd be comfy. Like if we go with Thomas Party, uh, Declan Rice, and Odegaard, yeah, I, I, I think we've they've only conceded one goal less than Arsenal this. Uh, sorry, one goal more than Arsenal this season in the league, which I was quite shocked about to be fair because they ain't been good, have they? But I think the 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 goals that they've scored, they've scored eleven goals in the league, and two of them have come in their last two. Uh, sorry, six of them have come in their last two games. So there's an issue with them scoring. Yes, they don't necessarily get battered but they ain't played us yet. And I think that 
international probably came international break probably came at the wrong time for both teams because we've just come off of the back of beating Man City, and then it's two weeks off. And it's like, oh, you just want to play again, don't you? So I don't know. I think that we've got all of our players fit apart from Yuri and Timba. Yeah, I think that we're unbeaten. We've won their three years on the spin. I don't see them scoring twice. And I think we'll score at least two. I, I, if I was to predict a score, I'd say 3-1. Yeah, and, and maybe even more, maybe 4-1. Like, we've seen this Chelsea team with their, their heads drop. Yeah, they're all looking around at each other now when it's all going wrong for them. So, and I think if they go with Conor Gallagher in midfield, oh my days. Yeah, cheers. Please play him. I mean, there's talk about them giving him a new deal. I mean, a lot of Chelsea fans now are starting to praise Conor Gallagher and the improvements he's made so far this season. Are you someone that just, you can't see that? You think he's a, a bang average player? Palace was about his level. If that. He had a good-ish season at, at Palace, but they've done a billion quid and he's in midfield with the captain's armband on. What's that all about? I, I look at their squad. Now, I know they've got a lot of players out injured, but look at the squad and you're just like, who are these players? Yeah, and then they're playing Enzo further forward. Why? If you're going to play Conor Gallagher, you play him at a 10 and you put Enzo next to Caicedo. Yeah, he's doing it the other way around. It makes no sense. You don't know his best 11. Yeah, he's chopping and changing. I know injuries play a part in that, but one week, Chilwell's at left wing. The next week, he's on the bench. Then he's at left back. It's like, it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Yeah, and the last three results have got their fans a little bit more optimistic, which I understand, but... Mm. We've beaten them three years on the spin at their ground. Yeah, and we've, we're unbeaten so far. We've conceded less goals so far than this time last season. I think we're doing comfortably. Although, if they get a win, that could now elevate them. Yeah, because they haven't had a real big test yet. Have they? I know they played Liverpool first day of the season. But Liverpool, first day of the season, it could have gone either way. Yeah, with us, we're now... Well, eight games in, this will be the ninth game. We've had a couple of Champions League games. You'd say the fitness levels with international games as well. The fitness levels will be there. We ain't got no injuries apart from Simba. It's all set up for Arsenal to do them comfortably, in my opinion. Do you not feel there could be an element here of overconfidence that may creep into this because it's three wins on the bounce already? Chelsea haven't, in your no. words, haven't been tested yet. Do you think that you, you could be being a little overconfident here? Well, I said we've got a Tottenham as well, didn't I? So <laughs> that went well. <laughs> Cheers, Jorginho. Cheers, mate. But um, no, I don't think so. I think that you've only got to have a look at their last 12 months. Like They've been beaten by so many teams in the last 12 months. If we can't go there and beat them, then come on, seriously? Like, then the Chelsea fan in the chat putting Baku in, mate. Yeah, that, uh, how long ago was that? It was four years ago, mate. Four years ago. And then the other lad as well is put in Cal Connor Gallagher's really good. Tottenham wanted him. Well, that sums it all up then, doesn't it? <laughs> Tottenham wanted him. Jesus Christ. It's mad. Yeah, Chelsea, Chelsea is in form in terms of three wins in a row. But they're not really that good, are they? Let's be honest. And if we want to have serious aspirations of winning a title, you've got to go to Stamford Bridge and beat them. You don't go yeah, and I, beat I, them, you ain't winning nothing. I agree with that take. I think that I think Chelsea have started to improve. I, I think they're moving the ball around nicely. They've been hard to break down. Not putting the ball in the back of the net has cost them a few times this season, but I do see the green shoots of progress within them. However, this is going to be, in my opinion, their hardest game of the season. You guys are on the back of just beating City for the first time. Barring anything catastrophic in the next few days, you, you should go into this game with your strongest midfield of, of Partey, Rice and Odegaard and your strongest attack of Martinelli, Saka and Gabriel Jesus for the first time this season. And I think you're right with where Chelsea are in their progression and where Arsenal have been for the past 18 months and what you are, uh, many Arsenal fans believe you're moving towards. This is one of those games where, although it's tough, although it's Stamford Bridge, you should go and win. And that's, again, it's another one of those kind of gateway moments and challenges for Arsenal. Can they go and win now there when they're expected to? I feel like in the last three years, maybe, I don't know when you played them at Stamford Bridge last season, but I remember when you beat them 2-0 when Eddie and Ketty got the brace. I remember when you went into that game, and I remember the game that was on Boxing Day, I think the previous season, the, the consensus was you were going to lose those games. Does that make sense? And you won them. So this is a really intriguing 
battle where I think a lot of people outside of Chelsea, a lot of Chelsea fans are confident and, and they've got every right to back their club. A lot of people are saying that Arsenal are now the favourites at Stamford Bridge, which, in my opinion, for 15 or so years was never the case. It became a very hard place for you guys to go. It used to be a place you won at a lot, and then it changed. So, yeah, I'm really intrigued by this match because you're. I think Arsenal should win. But this Chelsea team does move the ball well. They have been hard to break down. It's a big test for both. I'm really excited about it. As a, as a neutral and as a spectacle, I'm very, very excited about this game. It's going to be intriguing to watch. It really, really is. It really is. Yeah, mate, I agree. I, I agree. It's going to be interesting. It's a 5.30 kickoff as well. Um, and there's always dodgy results after an international spell. So, I don't know. I, I just think there's no way they beat us. Like, it's, all, it's all well and good saying that like we couldn't win there for 15 years or whatever it was. Yeah, this ain't the same Chelsea. True. Yeah, that, that Chelsea is long gone, mate. It's Todd Bowley's Chelsea now. Yeah, and it's been a mess ever since he's got there. Yeah, and I can see a way where maybe they score. Maybe they don't, but they ain't scoring twice. They ain't scoring twice against us. And if we go out there with high energy, high tempo, yeah, with Saliba Gabriel at the back <coughs> and Party Rice in midfield, I just think it's going to be light work, mate. Like I do. Light work. Mm. Uh, Super Jet here says Lens can do it, but not Chelsea. Was Brighton not a test? I don't get the point. Well, he's saying you guys lost the way at. Lons, who are not as good as Chelsea in his opinion, and they beat Brighton recently, who are a good team at home. So why can't Chelsea beat you if Lons beat you? If not, yeah. Well, they can, but it ain't happening. Like, I mean, if you if you look at the teams, yeah, you lost Chelsea lost to Southampton last season. Bottom of the table, relegated. Yeah, it's what it is, isn't it? It's what it is. Anyone can lose to anyone on a given day, but we ain't losing to them. No way in a million years we're losing to them. Uh, Sonny here says, I've heard all these other, uh, sorry, I've heard all those that moved to Saudi teams are not happy because of the crowds being small. It's not just the same level. Yeah, that's, that's probably true on that. Thanks, Sonny. We'll come back to that super chat maybe a bit later when it's uh, sort of on point and on topic here. Um, Jason here says, Lee, be humble and respectful. Footy gods are watching. You curse an North London derby. <laughs> I hope Saka and Saliba are fit. Hopefully we will be very good game and three points. Come on, you gooners. Yeah, I think they'll both be fit. Saliba had a toe injury, I think. I think he'll be fine. And Saka didn't go on international break anyway. So, yeah, I think he'll be back. So, the only one we've got out is Timber. Unless any of them come back from the, the game. I think there's games tonight. I think England played, didn't they? So, yeah, England played tonight. Declan Rice didn't play the other night, though, I don't think. So yeah, he'll play tonight. It's against Italy at home. So uh, Rice will definitely play for England tonight. There's almost no doubt about it. So yeah, you just got to I think there's literally a couple of more days of games. Um, I'm not too sure. Well, other other guy had a night off the other night, didn't he? Against Spain. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had a night off. I see somebody post a tweet. I quoted it. That's a massive account. What would these two do in the Premier League together? Talk about um, Ireland and Odegaard. I was like, exactly what they'd do for, for their nation, mate. Nothing. Yeah, one ghost as soon as he gets pressed, and the other one scores goals in a six-yard box. But if the ghost is ghosting, he ain't getting any chances, is he? Like, come on. Yeah, and then I had somebody say to me the other day, yeah, but he plays, they play for Norway. They're not expected to get out of this. Okay, how comes Albania are top of their group? Yeah, I, I think when, look, Norway... How come, how come Scotland have qualified out of that group? Scotland, expected... Scotland Den- Denmark, listen, Denmark have got... They play San Marino tonight, which is a win, because everybody beats them. They'll be on 19 points, and Denmark, Denmark are not like Denmark are good, but that's the point. I, I don't see why Norway should be performing a lot better than they are. Like they've got they've got some good footballers there. They've got some good footballers in Norway. They should be doing a lot better than they are. There's no doubt about that. It really is. Yep. Uh, this year says Forest beat you uh, at home, so why can't Arsenal? Stupid logic is what Highbury Ultra says. <laughs> exactly. We've been in three years in a row, so yeah. We've got Declan Rice in midfield now. Party's back fit. No reason not to beat him. And I think we will beat him. I don't see where they get two goals from, and they're going to need at least two. So Mm. I don't think it's happening. They're they're, they're just getting giddy, Chelsea fans, because they've had nothing to scream and shout about for the last 12 months. And they pammed Burnley 4-1. I think they were 1-0 down in that, weren't they? So if Burnley can score against them, why can't we, first and foremost? Right? Yes, I, I know they batted them four in the second half or whatever it was, but... 
No, nah, man, we're, we're miles clear of Burnley. If we go one nil up, they're finished. Do you know what's really weird about your opinion? The only thing that's weird about it, it's just weird seeing you back Arsenal. <laughs> yeah, people, yeah, but Terry, people, people, we speak for like an hour and a half, two hours or whatever on, on a Tuesday, yeah? People that watch my channel on a regular basis know that I do praise Arsenal. But it's no, I know, I know you I yeah, I'm being like, <laughs> it's, why, it's why I made a point. Yeah, you'll get loads like, of clicks and retweets. You can set up channels cussing me and you'll get loads of views and all that. Like, that's what people do, isn't it? They don't watch me on a regular basis. It's a bit like the PGMOL that emailed you about your title. They didn't watch it, did they? Exactly. Uh, Daryl here says, does Win the Dog have a puppy named Bottled the Pup? Bottled the Pup. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hey, wait till winner. Wait till winner's pups, mate. Yeah, because this is gonna continue on and on and on and on, isn't it? Is winner boy or a girl? I think it's a girl. Okay, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I haven't, we'll be I, willing I, her I, out. On, we'll be willing her out on match day soon, mate. I think it's quite good. I like it. I like of it. Of course you do, because you've got your emotions and feelings attached to it. Oh, look how cute! But that's what I wanted. Yeah. Oh, no, look. I just oh, find it... family. Oh, and family. I love dogs. it. I think it's like... great. I don't think there's. I don't think there's anything wrong with it when things are, uh, are progressing and going well. Um, <laughs> I really don't. I, I really don't. I think that Arsenal are moving in completely the right direction. So they need buy-in. They need fans putting money, and they need to make people feel that way so that they can continue to grow. Where it would become a problem yeah, is if they weren't. No, wait, wait, moving... sorry, sorry, one sec. You oh, mean continue oh. to finesse people that everything's rosy? Well, I think you're moving again, but as I've said, I, I don't think everything's rosy because you need to win some major trophies. But I think you're moving towards that. Where I'd be more, where I'd be concerned if I was a gooner is they were doing all of this, but the Sackers and the Martinellis and the, the, the Salibas were not getting these new long term lucrative deals. And you were looking like they were all going to, you know, like your team with the Sami Nazaris and the Cess, how they all left. If that was looking like it was going to repeat itself, then I'd have a problem with all the PR and which essentially creates traffic and, and, and you sell to those fans and you make money. It does feel like at the moment you're trying to use that income to grow and benefit the teams to become better on the football pitch. However, like I said, like I, I feel like you're moving in the right direction. I still think you've got to challenge things. I still think you've got to keep your eye on it as fans to make sure that that continues to happen. But yeah, I, I wouldn't have a problem right now with the way Arsenal as a football club are talking because you are moving in the right direction. You're on that journey. And, I, you know, I've said it for a while. I think you are over the next few years going to win some more major trophies with this with this manager. And I think if you do, then you will look at everything you've done and go, it was all part of what's helped create that. And although some people go, well, what a dog has helped you win a league, a, min a, a minor amount, yes, because I think you're... What I've kind of noticed is when fans are happy, and when fans, generally speaking, are behind their team, the team also improves because there is a feeling of support. There are times where you've got to criticise, times where you've got to boo, times where you've got to get on at your team. And I've even heard Man City fans at times in the last few years boo their team at half time when they've not been happy with performances. But they get back on ball very quickly because they're happy. Happy fan bases help football teams progress and move forward. So I think you've got to get the balance right. And I, I think what Josh Kroenke has done at your club and, and the way that... They've turned things around. Things have been very good so far. You want more. You want to go to a much higher level than this in terms of winning the trophies. But, yeah, I, again, I understand your standpoint, and I'm basically I'm going to be Mr. Grumpy until we win something major. And I, I get it. I get it. But I'm not – I don't need Arsenal to win. I just look at it and go, I wish my club was progressing like that because I think you're going to get somewhere good personally. So. Yeah, it just make you feel better about your weekend, Terry. That's all it is. Yeah, oh, look, yeah, we're, we're going in no. the right direction. What's the what does that even mean? No, so it's not like it's not about making me feel good about my weekend. So I will give you an example, right? I'm I've started training again. I'm eating better, been back in the gym. A week in, there's no real difference in me at all, other than I feel better as an example. But I'm happy with that already because I know it's going to help progress me moving forward. And I know the journey I'm going on and I know where I'm going to end up. But I'm going to enjoy the process as an example. If I run a business. I might have a goal for my estate agency to get to a certain size. But as I can see this progression, and I believe that we're going to get to where I want to be, I can enjoy that process. If, for instance, my business was moving in a direction that I didn't like, or if I was going to the gym but coming home and eating McDonald's, I probably wouldn't feel as good about either of those processes. So I just think it's about if you believe you're going to get to the end of the rainbow, you can relax and enjoy that process. So as I say, I look at Arsenal, and I think you're going to get there. So from my point of view, I'm somewhat jealous of what your the way a lot of your fans feel in the direction your club is going in with Man United, 
celebrating the PR would be exactly what you've said because I don't feel like there's progression, but we bought a dog, so I feel good for a few days. That would be weird. I want my club progressing properly. So I do think you're moving in the right direction as a club, 100%. 100%. Heard it all before, mate. Well, not for me, you ain't. <laughs> no, but I've heard it all before. Yeah, I've, I've not heard anyone talking about young squad this season, by the way. Have they all suddenly grown up? Well, they're a year older, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> but last season it was oh but it's a young squad it's a young squad push down our throats every day like i know that this season why is that that's, is that's where i'm beating top of the league or joint no, I, tell you, I tell you why that, no, but i tell you why that is it's because last year the level of progression you demonstrated was relatively unexpected even by some of the most diehard positive arteta winners and the people that were saying that were right they were trying not to put too much pressure on these young people too soon they, they believe that was the right way to go a year later, after spending another hundred odd plus million, bringing in a player of Declan Rice's level, all those young players that were excellent last year, being one year older with the experience of last year, the reason why you're not hearing it is because people are not using that as an excuse now. And there's more of a well, we need to we need to maintain this and go to another level. They're not they're literally not as young as they were last year because everybody has gained a, a year of a year of experience, and you brought in older and or more experienced players than you already have so i think that's why you're hearing less of it because it isn't as prevalent or as important this year now that you're one year further in and you'll hear it you'll definitely want to hear it next year in any capacity because oh no we're, we're here phases and rainbows and sparkles and dogs oh wind's had a puppy right do you know what i mean round 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 we go yeah that's why i get the umbrella table because if we don't win anything this season and just get champions league football again most of this fan base will be happy with it yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's, a, that's a buy the buy for the point I'm making. What I hope they do if you win the league, I don't want you to win the league. I want Man United to win it. If you do win the league, I swear what they've got to do just to wind you up, Lee, is, is put a medal around Wynn's neck. They've got to do it. Just to, and hold him up there with the trophy. Oh, please, I'd love to see your well, face Saka on that. Saka's held the puppy before, so maybe Saka can hold him. Yeah, a bit of that, mate. A bit of that. I'll put, put a medal around his neck. Uh, Super Chat here says, uh, apparently every 20-year-old Arsenal fan in spaces grew up with their club winning titles, not to Lee, by the way. Well, every 20-year-old in spaces. <laughs> <laughs> every 20-year-old is a liar. Uh, Star-Lord here says, big up Terry and Lee. This is my favourite TFT show. Thank big you, Star-Lord. Uh, Chike says terry trivia question tell me what sports franchise is the most valuable in terms of income and are known as america's team people are employees i'm going to say the new york yankees that off the top of my head i'm going to say the new york Yankees. let me google that american america's team oh no dallas is that the dallas cowboys i don't know I don't watch American sports. Dallas Cowboys, that's coming up as America's team. Are they really? Do you know what I found out about baseball? And I don't think this is true about American football. To keep it like to keep it like an equilibrium, like New York Yankees caps are probably the most sold caps in the world, right? Like you've ever you've seen them everywhere, right? New York Yankee caps, especially back in the day. Say one franchise sells a bit of half a, a million hats. That money is spread equally across all the teams in the league or percentages of that money is spread across all the teams in the league. So nobody can gain a bigger financial monopoly than others. I always find weird about American sports. The way they operate their sporting system is like the most un-American part of it. Like America is all capitalistic and get to the top and be the biggest and the best. And when it comes to sport, they don't let anybody kind of run away with things. But I might have explained that a little wrong, but I swear I read something along those lines before. Uh, the Cowboys haven't won the Super Bowl since 1966. There we go. Thanks for letting me know. I don't, as I said, I don't, I don't follow it. Um, I don't follow it, but there we go. Uh, what's your super chat here say? Uh, uh, Lee uh, said Ronaldo is not better. He's not a better footballer, Terry. Terry, don't let Lee off the hook. Ask him about Eto's career versus Thierry Henry's. Who is the better footballer objectively? Who's the better footballer, Thierry Henry? Well, 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 why? See, that makes no sense whatsoever. Not a better footballer, Terry, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, Terry, don't let Lee off the hook. Ask him about Eto's career. But then who's the better footballer is at the end? So you're using amount of trophies, yeah, or success of trophies to determine how good a footballer is. That makes no sense. Yeah, because anyone who's got half a brain knows they were both brilliant. 
but Omri's better. It doesn't matter whether Omri's won less. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you another example. I actually think Lucas Mora has won more than Thierry Omri. Does that mean on your basis right there that Lucas Mora is a better player than Thierry Omri? No, again, <laughs> that, that, go, that, go, that, that, I mean, that, that for me is, I get where you're coming from overall, but that, that for me is like a straw man point because no one is claiming that just winning the trophies makes you better. They're talking about the players who were amazing in the teams that achieved amazing things. It's well, like when I've mentioned Paul Scholes' trophies, people go, yeah, but Luke Chadwick's won more Premier Leagues than Gerrard's that make him better. That isn't the argument. The argument is we know Paul Scholes is top class. We know Gerard is top class. So when it comes down to looking at overall who who had the best career, biggest legacy, bet, bet, the best footballer, the, the whole caboodle, Scholes being integral in teams that won multiple trophies is a factor as to why I believe he's better than Steven Gerrard. Because Paul Scholes, we know, year in, year out, delivered consistently in title races and there's pressure moments that are hard to deliver in. So I think it... It, it counts. Lucas Moura being like winning loads of league titles, being a being a secondary player for PSG, powers into insignificance for me because was he integral in that? Was he the reason they were delivering it? And then what's the level of those trophies as well? Like winning winning league R with pa Paris Saint Germain. Again, I just don't see it as that big of an achievement in football personally. Mainly because PSG have such a monopoly in that country as well. But I would personally also say, by the way, I do think Henri was better. Just, just, just to agree with that, I think Henri was better personally. But um, Etu was absolute top class. Uh, Neymar is 31 and moved to Saudi. Hazard retired at 32. Ronaldo being almost 39, competing with the likes of Haaland and Mbappe shows why he's, in, why he's indeed the GOAT. No two ways about it. If you put Haaland and Mbappe in the Saudi league, they would absolutely run riot if, with Harlan's case, yeah, he had, say, he walked into, say, Ronaldo comes out of the team he's at. Oh, one second. Sorry, mate. Hang on. No, wait. Go, go do what you got to do. Look, I, look, he's definitely in the goat comment. Where me and Lee disagree is it's about Lee's view, in my opinion, of what a brilliant footballer is. Lee is of the school of people that looks, yes, they look at goals and things but it's about how it looks me and lee actually sat backstage after last week's show when we spoke about burkamp and we looked at burkamp's greatest goals because he said the finishing was better and even this is like a agree to disagree burkamp's best goals the finishes were good the skill before the finishes were absolutely disgustingly good for some people they go that's all together is the finish where the finish in my head is the is the shot that puts the ball into the back of the net so I think sometimes it's about how we all perceive football. And the debate shouldn't be who's better. It should be, well, let's talk about how we perceive the game. So, yeah, look, Ronaldo's up there for me. There are certain things that people are better than Ronaldo at. But the fact that he is this good a goal scorer and no one else in the history of football has ever scored at this level, he simply has to be in the conversation for GOAT. I know a lot of people are going to give it to Messi, and I get why, because the goals and that are up there, the skill set's there. And I said when he won the World Cup, he was, and I'll stand by that. I'm not going to change my mind. But the idea that Ronaldo isn't a, one of the greatest footballers of all time is crazy, in my personal opinion. Um, but there we go. Thanks for that super chat, bro. It means a great deal to me. Uh, this question for you, Henri or Suarez? Oh. <laughs> Suarez is mad, I can't lie. Yeah, as far as is unbelievable, mate. Hmm. Got Omri as well. Like, that's a tough one. That is a proper tough one. I can't split them. I can't lie. They were both unreal. <laughs> I can't split them, mate. I saw a tweet from someone the other day that said that Luis Suarez, in their opinion, is the greatest number nine to have ever played football. He, he was... The thing is, both, both, I don't know if he's the greatest number nine to ever play football, but his output, as well as his ability, is mad. Yeah, and it's all types of different goals as well. And he's done it at multiple clubs. And, I mean, look at when he got that ban in the Premier League. He come back and still won Golden Boot. Yeah, scoring goals from near the halfway line and stuff. Like, unbelievable player. But I, think, I, I can't split them two, man. Yeah, that's when, that's when, close. When you it. talk about Luis Suarez, one of those things, I find I do find it hard with Suarez to be objective. Because of what he did to Patrice Evra, I, I, I have a bias. Because subjectively, I, I don't like the man. What he did to Patrice Evra and the fact that 
I think he was very fortunate that it happened in 2012 and not 2022. The world, and that's only 12, 13 years ago, but the world has changed so much in that time, especially from a social media point of view. Like, people, like youngsters that haven't, go back and read what he was doing in that game. Pinching the guy's skin, pinching uh, Patrice Everest's skin and referring to him. I'm not even going to use the words that he used, of course, but belittling him because of that, pinching his skin and saying stuff to him. Like, you just wouldn't get away with that anymore. You've seen that video during the rounds on Instagram where he's trying to justify it. Oh, like, mate, I, I've, seen, I've seen it many, many times. And I think for me, I, I always, because of what he did to Patrice, I always find it hard to rate him. If I'm speaking objectively, remove all my emotion and look at the stats, the facts, and how good he was, he's one of the greatest number nines I've ever seen play football in my life. He was, he was just different. He also came in during an era where, like, stats... He just started scoring goals. Like Henri was a great goal scorer, but and I have seen some interesting debates on this that they believe score people believe scoring goals now is easier than in Henri's era because there isn't as many great defenders as there used to be, and that's an intriguing one because that then also goes to mean that the goals that the Messi and Ronaldo's have scored shouldn't be held in as high a regard. But that's another debate for another day. But yeah, they're both brilliant. I'd personally pick Henri again if I had to choose him one of them to come play for my team. I would pick Henri, but that doesn't mean Suarez isn't. Wait, Arsenal, Arsenal could have had Suarez as well. Oh, it's 40 million and one. If you need to bid like 45, 50 million, he was yours. Oh, 100%, mate. I, I still never forgive Wenger for that. Mate, it's crazy. Uh, only <laughs> R9 is a better striker than Henri, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, no, R9, he yeah, was R9 up until them injuries, R9 just, just had everything. It, he had everything. He really did. Uh, most underrated in the Prem ever, in my opinion, Beckham or Burkamp. Both Burkamp did... was rated. I think yeah, Beckham Burkamp, was rated. Burkamp was heavily rated again in his era when he was around. No, even rival. He was. He was. This is how good he was. Even rivals were like, wow. He was. He was one of those players that was almost universally liked by rivals, probably mm. barring Tottenham. Uh, Beckham. Beckham. I think people Beckham's probably the most underrated out of the two because I've I've never met a yeah. football fan. That don't rate Burkamp. Yeah, yeah. yeah Beckham, like they always said, "Wow, what Beckham player was, Beckham, Yeah, that. Beckham's fame and celebrity made people overlook how good a football player he was because he was out. He was out of this world. Uh, for me, I've always said the most underrated player, in my personal opinion, in the Premier League era was Michael Carrick, and not that he was the best who was underrated, but it was just the way people did. So I run a midfield for ten years for Man United, and people were acting like he weren't that good, and one more, and it's it, it just ridiculous. And I think the palette. An understanding of football in England was so much different 15 odd years ago. Yeah, Michael Carrick's always been my twist for that, but that's just me. Uh, American sports wants par parody. Uh, every fan base in the NFL thinks they have a shot um, at the title every year. That is a better long term model. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from with that. However, though, I view it from this point of view. It's different now because money's come into to football. But the reason why certain teams, if your club back in the day, was run well for 10, 15, 20 years by brilliant local owners that cared. And you won more, you generate more income, you could keep growing, you could create a dynasty and you could maintain it. And that for me was a reward for you being run well. The thing I don't like about the American model, I get what you mean, but it's almost the better your, your run is going to help other people. So for me, I, I just don't, the part of me don't like that, but I hear why it's there. Uh, Etu, the best player in two trebles back to back. It's a great point. It's a great, great point. A uh, question for you both. Arsenal are in the, the Champions League final, but you have six defenders to pick from. Who's the first one? Oh, Giroud, Scalacci, 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 Sigan, Senderos, and Stefano. Who are you choosing? <laughs> None of them. I'll just go all out attack and just put 11... 11 strikers on the pitch or 11 midfielders. Or it's Listen, you're probably going to have to pick Senderos and Mustafi because on their day, they're all right. Like every now and then, there's some good games. I don't remember. Uh, I'd, I'd pick I'd pick Seagan. Yeah. Seagan and probably Mustafi. Seagan, Mustafi. Giroud, he played right back, Giroud, right? Was he centre back? No, he played centre back. Who was, no, who was the right back that played in the 8 2 drumming that you sold a day later? Why do I want to say his name was Giroud? Probably wasn't. What's his name? I thought it was a Bue, wasn't it? Might have been Did a Bue play in that game? I can't remember. No, it wasn't a Bue. It wasn't a Bue. 
the, the chat or someone in the chat, I remember. There's a I swear he played right back on the day, and a day or two later, you guys sold him. Now it wasn't, it definitely wasn't a boue. It wasn't a boue because he's a midfielder. This guy was a defender. Uh Torre, it was Torre. Oh, Torre, right? I meant Torre, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, he, I he, was, he was that good. I forgot he even through. played for us, mate. <laughs> I mean, he might have been left back, might have been right back, one of the two. No, Jenkinson's was right back, and he got sent off in that game. Yeah, I think he played left back. Yeah, that's it. Uh, super chat, super chat, super chat. In my opinion, Park G Sung was underrated. Yeah, man, like, yeah. Uh, we had the best nickname for him as a club. We used to call him Free Lungs, because a man could just keep running. I like that name. <laughs> uh, sorry, chat, come in late. Chelsea will lose, is what Sonny says here. Uh... Yeah, the players are not happy with the amount of fans at the game. Yeah, it's going to take a while for that league to grow, man. It's going to take a while. Yep. Uh, this here says, uh, Arsenal fan, but wow, this guy at Waffles is a waffle maker. Who's this talking about me or you? Could be either, really, <laughs> couldn't it? <laughs> uh, Mr. Tirebox says, can't wait to destroy Chelsea this weekend. Another step yeah. towards the title. Big up, Terry, and my man, Lee Gunner. Big up, bro. There you go. He's confident as well. He is. Kevin Lee, sorry, Kevin Lee, Kevin L says, if Lee was trolling, most of his takes would make a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> he also says, Lee, can you choose, you can only choose one in January. Who are you taking, Tony or Pedro Neto? Tony. I think, yeah. he, I think we need him more than we need Pedro Neto if it was the choice of one or the other, but I want them both. I'm greedy. And I think if we yeah. get them both, we win the league. I think if we only get Tony, still not sure we can overtake City with just Tony. But I think we need both. I can imagine. Oh, I'll be I'll be there. After my match reaction, I'll be there to watch everything Lee says if they win the league. It'll be so intriguing. It'll just be so intriguing. Yeah, because uh, well, nobody's ever seen me celebrate a league win for my team, have they? So I think that'll probably be my most viewed stream, Terry. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'll be intrigued by it. Not, not, <laughs> oh, not look, even, it, look, you see his face from Britain through his teeth smiling. <laughs> It's people come up with so many scenarios no, that don't just exist. Because, just because I'd be so intrigued if you won the league, because then you've achieved what all your all your anger, frustration, everything it is. I'd just be intrigued to see. What, I don't know what the reaction is going to be like. I, I, I'm Neither intrigued. Do I. To see it. Do I. Let's see it happen first. No, I hear you, bro. Listen, viewers, thank you all for tuning in. Please hit the like button. Please subscribe to the terrace as ever. I'm live tonight after England take on Italy. So I will see you then. Mr. Gunner, always a pleasure to speak football with you. Until next time, viewers, take care. Goodbye. God bless. And I'll see you all again very, very soon.